Uh, my relationship with Dave is incredibly complicated. If anyone has read the Eater article about the demise of Lucky Peach, it, it was a really hard environment to be in, and I didn't leave under good circumstances. And so, you know, when Dave reached out to write the book, I was a bit taken aback and, and really surprised. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm senior editor Anna Hiesel, here with editor-in-chief Matt Rodbard. Today on the show, I'm catching up with an old friend and the first two-time guest on The Taste Podcast. Priya Krishna has had a meteoric rise in food media, starting in the marketing department at Lucky Peach to holding down roles at Bon Appetit and now the New York Times, where she is a star reporter on the food desk. In this interview, we talk about her new book she wrote with David Chang, Cooking at Home, and how they both set out to write a book that was clearly not Momofuku 2.0. We also talk about some of her recent stories at the New York Times, as well as in the pages of Taste. And as always, make sure to visit tastecooking.com for our latest stories, inventive recipes, and to sign up for our newsletter, which drops on Monday, the Big Monday interview, Wednesday, home cooking tips and recipes, and Friday, the week in food writing. Here's my talk with Priya. Priya Krishna, welcome to the Taste Podcast. You are the first two-time guest. Wow, what an honor. Do I get a prize? I mean, maybe. <laughs> like, uh, we've got some bottles of water. We're here at Penguin Random House in the building. Um it's a little bit empty here, but we're in the studio. We see each other for the first time in two and a half years, maybe two with, years. With plexiglass between us. How romantic. It is great. <laughs> it is absolutely uh, the vibe, the vibes, <laughs> uh, the plexiglass. The vibe. <laughs> um, let's talk about cooking at home first, because I want to, it's your new book you've written with Dave Chang. And I just want to get a sense of your relationship with Dave. You know, you work together at Lucky Peach. We met when you were on the marketing team, I mm -hmm. believe, yeah. uh, and then we started working together on some taste stories. Um, and you know, your rise in food media has been so I respect it and I love to see it. And and you work at the New York Times now as a staffer, but just let's go back to like you and Dave. This book is written, co-written. The two of you have come together to write it. Describe your relationship with Dave over the years, and and how did you land on this concept? which is not really a traditional cookbook. Uh, my relationship with Dave is incredibly complicated. Uh, <laughs> I you know, worked at Lucky Peach, which was a food magazine owned by Momofuku at the time. That was my first job out of college. Dave and I certainly like, you know, got along. We're both Leos. We seem to see eye to eye, but like, you know, Dave was like sort of this larger than life figure and if anyone has read the Eater article about the demise of Lucky Peach, that was like it, it was a really hard environment to be in, and I didn't leave under good circumstances. And so, you know, when Dave reached out to write the book, I was a bit taken aback and, and really surprised. And I have to say, like, I have to shout out Chris Ying and Rachel Kong, two of my colleagues at Lucky Peach, who were really, like, basically the reason I decided to do this book, because we all, we basically, like, all decided that we were going to like allow Dave room to acknowledge his mistakes and grow. And so I went into this book just being like, I don't know what this is going to be. Maybe it's going to be a really terrible experience. Maybe it'll be a really great experience. Honestly, it's like been one of the most like exciting and like interesting creative projects I've ever worked on. The way Dave's mind works is it's like in incredible. Well, first, it's very fast. I'm sure yeah. he like fires off ideas um, faster than most folks. <laughs> he also like as someone who spends my entire life like w trying to figure out like the perfect way to describe something. The fact that Dave can like drop of the hat, come up with like a metaphor mm -hmm. or like is just like truly remarkable to me. And so when we started writing the cookbook, he was like, listen, I will never and I have never followed a recipe. The idea of writing a cookbook with recipes to me has always felt disingenuous. I don't want to write Momofuku part two. I want to write something that feels true to who I am now, which is basically like a guy who used to work in kitchens and now is staying at home to cook for his son and his wife. 
So how do we, instead of giving people recipes, give them strategies? How do you use what food you already have in your pantry, you already have in your fridge, and put together something delicious? This is not the first No Recipe Cookbook. In fact, the New York Times put out a No Recipe Cookbook like less than a year ago. And it's a concept that's been pretty clear in food media that you know this intuitive cooking is something that more moderate to advanced chefs are going to be able to do. So how do you get with this, you know, tackling this no recipe concept, how do you get buy-in from your reader that this book is essential? And read, a listener, I will say it is essential because I learned a lot and I've written cookbooks myself. So for, it's a great book. But how do you get the buy-in to follow through and reading like reading through this this book? I think the key to our book is that we are giving you a ton of Guidance. We're not just throwing you into the recipe and saying, add a handful of this, a splash of that. We're saying, okay, let's take a step back. How do you season a broth? What's the order of operations? What do you start with? Okay, you put your water in. You season it until it tastes this level of salty. Okay, let's take a step back and figure out what your salt preference is. Here's an exercise to help you figure out your salt preferences. Now let's figure out like how acid- acidic you like food versus how spicy you like food. Let's take a step back and figure out figure out that. So it's really like, I think so many No Recipe Recipe books sort of drop people in without sort of giving them that, that context. Our idea is like, if you have never, ever cooked before, like we're going to sort of teach you how to, how to season, how to construct a dish, what the sort of more back to basics elements are of like putting something delicious together really fast. With a reliable narrator too, I must say. I think like the narrators are important in this book because no recipe recipe books are oftentimes written by non-entities or by media companies. But you and Dave have a dialogue in the book, right? You're talking together. Yeah, and and I feel like I was constantly checking against Dave's like chefy instincts because like I really am a home cook. I have worked in kitchens, but my career hasn't been defined by working in kitchens the way that Dave's career has been. So I was very much the one being like, no home cook is going to do this. I would never buy that. I would never do this. And so like, you know, we in the book, like I basically say that whenever I feel that way, whenever I'm like, actually, this is how I would do it or I don't actually... I didn't actually like the way that this did or like this felt a little bit too finicky. Mm -hmm. And so it was like a really nice push and pull between my like home cooking instincts and Dave's sort of chef instincts that have really been like modified now by like the fact that he has a kid and a wife and he is sort of like the primary cook at home. Is there an example of like a tool that you're like, come on, Dave, they're not using the cryovac. They're not using this type of mandolin slicer. They're not using Urfa Bieber. Which I, I disagree. I think Irfa Bieber is wonderful. So let's scratch that from the record. Irfa Bieber is great. <laughs> <laughs> but what, is there an example of how you've dialed back Dave Chang's cooking brain? Um. Oh, you know, like Dave, let's see. I mean, he he loves his donabe. And I think that donabes are amazing. And then I went home and made all of those dishes in just like my regular pot. <laughs> and I was like... It works just fine. Came out delicious. Priya, but the clay. It's all about the clay. <laughs> uh, such an interesting point because we've written about the Danabe. We fetishize mm. the Danabe. They're such beautiful yeah. vessels to bring, but they're a pain in the ass to clean. And maybe they break if you drop them. <laughs> yeah. And I ended up buying a Donabe because I was like, well, I guess I'll try it both ways. And I was like, you know what? Like, I would say that it was like it was very good and it looked beautiful in the donabe, but it was pretty it, it tasted great in the pot. <laughs> yeah. So you reject the notion of a pantry section, which I love. Like you're not telling your reader to buy X, Y, Z. How did that kind of come about? This idea that the pantry section is maybe obsolete. Well, it's just sort of this idea that there should exist a a singular pantry that everyone should have, you know, crushed red pepper flakes and garlic and preserved lemons. I feel like there's sort of this like almost like, you know, aspirational pseudo global pantry that's become popular of late when in fact like everyone's pantry reflects their preferences reflects how they grew up reflects the little spices and jars that their parents put in their cupboard when they first moved to a new city and we really wanted to like honor and respect that rather trying to impose like okay here like the 
12 things that belong in your pantry because your pantry is your pantry. Your tastes are your tastes. Like we want to respect that. It feels like it's almost like this muscle memory of cookbook editors to say, okay, well, the first chapter has to be the pantry section. But you make a really good point that no pantry fits all. Even in a book that's even in like Indianish, I guess. What was your pantry section there? It was probably not as clear as I didn't have a pantry there section for the very that exact reason. <laughs> I just had like a spice explainer. Sure, sure. Agree to disagree with me, and I, I feel this is interesting point to bring up with you. I feel like these recipes and the head notes they strip away some cultural context. Um, you and Dave, of course, tackle culture and cross cultural cooking um, in your writing on Recipe Club uh, podcast and Dave Chang Show, but. It feels like this book in particular is sticking with the cooking techniques. Do you feel that's fair? Was that a conscious effort? I think it was one of those things where Dave and I were both like, you know, we cook based off of foods that we have loved, foods that we have tried. We are not experts in those cuisines. Even Dave would not consider himself an expert in Korean cuisine, and I would not consider myself an expert in Indian cuisine. So we really wanted to like lean into the fact that like we are not experts. We are just people cooking what seems delicious to us at home. And in fact, in 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 every section where we're talking about foods from different cultures, we include books that people should go and study if they if they want to learn more about. Korean food, about Japanese food, about Indian food, because like I think, you know, I think while we both are good cooks who know how to make food delicious, I think it is really important to sort of like honor and acknowledge like why should you make our version of pho? This version is a version, a a really delicious soup that Dave makes when uh, he can't order pho from like his local pho place. And it's a really quick, simplified version that'll get you like pho flavors fast. So if you make this and you love it and you're like, this is really delicious, go buy Andrew Nguyen's pho cookbook and learn from an actual expert. So the hope is like we're giving you like a a little a little taste, but really encouraging you to do do the research too. Yeah, that really threads the needle, that approach. And I, I think you do pay respect to the source material through books, as you you say, or just anecdotes. You know, Dave has plenty of Korean and Korean American anecdotes in the book, and there's a Colby Jim recipe that talks about his you know his own att- attachment or, or interest in that in that recipe, but um, you're going to learn to cook m- with this book. Like that is like the one, two and three goals, right? Yeah. It's like, you're, you're going to learn to cook. You're going to learn to cook in a very multicultural way, but this is not the end all be all of how to make these dishes. Okay. So Priya, what did you learn? I mean, from Dave, you know, you're cooking, you're, re- you're developing recipes in his apartment or in his house. I'm not sure where he did it. Like, what are some of your own personal takeaways from doing this project? I have to say, I, one thing you will notice if you read Indianish is that there is a section called one chicken and two fish recipes because it is like a 95% vegetarian book because I don't tend to cook meat at home. It's just like it's I grew up vegetarian. It's not I'm, I eat everything. I just like it's just like a reflex that I, at home I cook mostly vegetarian. And so like and I also I was like, you know what? I'm, I, I, I I'd rather like leave meat cooking to, you know, people in restaurants where I know they're, you know, they're they're, they're going to they're not going to mess it up in the way that I possibly could. Dave really made meat cookery feel so unintimidating to me. And it starts with this thing he taught me, which I think was like brilliant, which he calls the Tempur-Pedic test, which is his test of like when meat is ready. So he's like, my strategy is I fill a pot with water. I add salt to it. I put my meat in. I put it on a ripping boil And I just monitor it and make sure like and add water as necessary and wait until I can stick my thumb in the meat. Um, This is for primarily for like beef brisket. Yeah. Yeah. And I (laughs) and it like presses down like a Tempur-Pedic mattress, but then immediately like comes back up. Yeah. And as soon as he told me that, I was like, oh, and then you're just kind of like sticking your finger into meat and waiting for it to act like a Tempur-Pedic mattress. And you're like, oh, meat cooking 
is pretty easy. <laughs> and on that note of me cooking, I mean, you know, everyone who's followed Dave knows he's microwave hive. I mean, I think he's actually selling microwave products, but that's not for this podcast. You r- ask your uh, reader to subscribe to the microwave as a real tool. Yeah, I will say I was really skeptical of the microwave chicken thighs, but it makes so much sense because think about it. You open a plastic bag. There's like chicken juice that like splashes all over your counter. If you just open the bag and put it in a microwavable container, microwave it for eight minutes and then finish it in whatever sauce, you're like, there's no chicken juices splashing on the counter. You're guaranteeing you're not your cook. Your chicken is not going to be pink and raw inside I, like the micro. I have always subscribed to microwave cookery like my mom is like master of the microwave. We ma- microwaved our rice, our potatoes like we microwaved everything, our palau growing up. So when Dave was like, I'm going to blow your mind with my microwave recipes. I was like, dude. Been there, yeah, done been that. Been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love your microwave rice recipe and we talked about in the last podcast. So let me get this straight. Okay, you're going to the store, you're buying your bag of chicken, your Bell and Evans or whatever it is, organic, and your, your chicken thighs, you're bringing them back, you're putting them in the fridge. Okay, you're coming back and you're cooking and you're taking that bag out of the fridge, you're snipping it and you're putting it into a microwave safe bowl, putting it into the microwave and putting eight minutes in and cooking it? Yeah. That's it? And you're just cooking it to the point where it's not like raw anymore so it's not going to like contaminate your stuff and then you have a pan ready maybe you've got like some coconut milk with macroot lime leaves chilies uh you know all that some vegetables that are like just starting to cook you just take your chicken directly from the microwave dave uses scissors he cuts it up puts it in that curry lets it simmer for a little bit Good to go. And so, and so you're not scared of those juices in the bag. You're, you're 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 not fearing those juices. No, no. It's like literally a way to just like ensure that like you're not contaminating your kitchen surfaces. No, totally. <laughs> and I, I I really appreciate that you're avoiding like that split that splashing of the of that juice, which everyone's like, oh no, that juice is going to make me sick. Yeah. <laughs> probably pretty healthy. Probably okay to have a little. <laughs> Don't follow me. Don't sue me. Um, but I love that technique because it seems like that's too smart for its own good. Um, I mean, what else? Give me one more of like these these kind of hacky tricks that are in your book because it's filled with them. One of my favorites uh, that I love is when Dave makes cacio e pepe. You know, cacio e pepe, simple dish, can be a huge pain in the ass to do the dishes because you've got like the cheese bits kind of stuck to the bottom of the pot. Huge pain. So Dave does this thing where he first microwaves peppercorns in oil. Microwaving spices in oil is basically just a way. It's sort of it reminded me of like the tharka technique in Indian cuisine. It's like a way to infuse the oil and also like bloom the spices, basically. So he microwaves peppercorns in olive oil. Then he uh, cooks his pasta, drains the pasta, keeps a cup of water in a blender, he puts the olive oil, the peppercorns, uh, doesn't even grate the parm, just hunks of parm, pecorino, pasta water, um, and he blends it into a sauce, dumps it on the pasta, and... Multiplication happens, and boom, you're there. This is cacio e pepe. Wow. I made it for a dinner party, and that dish by far, people were like... How like who's which cacio e pepe recipe do you use? And I was like microwave and a blender. It's so great. <laughs> oh, it's and, you know, the book is filled with these t- with these tips and and there's 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 short anecdotes as well about just your relationship too. I feel like there's like your personality is in it as much as Dave's. I love that. Like, how did you strike that tone? That conversation between you and Dave? It sort of just came really naturally. Like, I just had a natural skepticism towards Dave and almost everything he was he was doing and so I was just like asking him I was just like asking him skeptical questions throughout and Dave was like I think that this conversation we're having now should be in the book like I think a lot of the time authors are afraid to get like critiqued by their co-authors but I would love to have like you your criticism or like your skepticism about this you know in in, in, in the book itself, you know, he was microwaving chow and mushi. I tried his recipe a million times in my microwave. It didn't work because my microwave is a shitty microwave that doesn't have power settings. And so I was like, I want you to know this may not work if you have a crappy microwave that doesn't have like a low power setting. Your chow and mushi may not turn out f- like fluffy and, and delicate. Was he humble in that moment? Did he did it take him some convincing to change 
the the recipe? Um, <laughs> Dave Chang the Humble, you pause. What we, <laughs> what we ended up doing was because because Peter Serpico, one of his chefs, taught him this mm. chow and mushi recipe, so he Ooh, was very. Up defensive of Peter being like, you know, this is Peter's golden ratio of, of, of you know, broth to, to eggs. And so it ended up being like, here's Peter's ratio, which works for Dave. And here's my ratio that works for me and my crappy microwave. Yeah. Do what feels right to you and your microwave and let us know which ratio works. Full transparency <laughs> in a cookbook. Enjoy that point of view. I hope more do that. I want to pivot to your work at the New York Times because it's it's been profound. Um, been reading you since you joined. But tell me, is there a beat that you consider yourself on? Is there a lane that you like to go into and like to, like to fill? I, I feel like... Um, you have people at the center of, of of a lot of your stories. I know that's like kind of a vague observation, but as opposed to like straight cooking technique, you're oftentimes reporting on people. That's me speaking, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about your time there. I feel like what has been really nice about being full time is being able to take a step back and like not just be like churning out pitches, but just asking like what are like big questions that deserve sort of meaty features that kind of unpack this. Like, what are s- stories that are really more like cultural commentaries? And I feel like that has sort of been the kind of stories I've gravitated towards that are like about a subject, but really like a broader cultural commentary on humanity through the lens of food. You know, like I was curious why the ethnic aisle still exists and it ended up being, you know, I unpacked like capitalism and, and, and grocery stores and how they function. I wrote a big uh, story that came out yesterday about um, the containers that our parents all reused from, you know, Royal Dansk butter cookie tins to country crock containers. And how is it that all of our parents were drawn to the same containers? And, you know, what what that says that we're all suddenly talking about this practice again on the Internet and, you know, speaking to a nostalgia and, uh Again, cap- capitalism. <laughs> the Royal Dance story hit me hard because my grandmother always kept a lot of uh, of her sewing and, and a lot of her items in those. Do you like those cookies? Do you eat those cookies? You know, what's so funny is I literally couldn't even tell you what the cookie tasted That's like because crazy. we used them for crayons. Like I, when I think of Royal Dance cookie tins, I like yeah. the smell of crayons is what That's... I think of. It's so great. Uh, and about the ethnic food aisle, I mean, that story, I think anyone who's had their on, like had their their eye on food and the culture around food, like taste or anywhere, has been trying to write that story. Like we've we've tried to write that story and we've not succeeded. But yours broke through in such a way. Your audience and your readers responded. There was actual change in some supermarkets because of your story, I, I think I read. Not not necessarily because of my story, but okay. I was surprised to find out that certain big corporate grocery stores were starting to make some changes that felt meaningful. It's exciting. I mean, that, that must really be gratifying when you write a story and there's actually some change happening. Oh, yeah, because you go into the story expecting to, you know paint like a picture of doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so when, you know, grocery stores are, are are actually doing something about it, it's especially the big the big chains, it's 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 exciting. But of course, again, you have a skeptical eye towards all of it. Yeah. And and tell me we had Julia Moskin on the podcast a couple years ago and she said she was working on like six stories at the same time. How do you operate? Do you work at one by one by one or do you have a lot of different are you working on a bunch of different stories? I'm usually working at like working on like three to four stories at one time and one will be like the one that's taking up all of my Mm -hmm. you know then one will be like a shorter story that I've just wanted to write one will be like a big long meaty story that I'm like slowly assembling string for and then another will be like another feature that's been you know like maybe like a news story that was put on my plate you know like last week um, I had you know read a bunch of reports of restaurant hosts being physically attacked at host stands for asking for vaccine verification. And I thought, you know, I think it's a good time to start talking to restaurant hosts about what life has been like for them, you know, now that they are like the sort of de facto bouncers at restaurants checking IDs and vaccination cards. So I picked up that story. I reported it really fast. So, you know, it's just like a, a mix of That's whatever nice comes, to have those yeah. quick turn uh, reported pieces as well. And really like hit, you know, the times so well is like just capture 
the the barometer of what's happening in food and culture. You also have written quite a few stories for Taste. Um, if you go back to your uh, to our earlier podcast, you can hear about your yogurt columns. We won't talk about that. It was one of my favorite uh, items that you wrote. But you wrote a few stories right before you left to, to join the Times. And one that um, that kind of struck a nerve with our readers was about cast iron, mm-hmm. about this fetishization of cast iron, and how um, mining some Twitter comments um, maybe six months ago, you were able to paint a picture of how cast iron almost got canceled. Talk about that a little bit. I, you know, you assigned me that story and I wasn't really sure what what direction I was going to go with it. And so I sort of started with the lady who wrote that, that she wrote this tweet being like, you know, no one's going to ever convince me to buy a cast iron pan. And her re- responses were like, it was, it was, it was wild with people being like, how dare you? It's the perfect place to like sear a steak. And then you realize that, like, I started reaching out to people who ran Facebook groups, and I've realized that just cast iron itself has just inspired such debates. Like, it's not even like, do you, yes, cast iron or no cast iron? It's how do you clean cast iron? It's what do you cook in cast iron? It's does your cornbread that you cook in your cast iron have, have like, this in it, or does it have, you know, not this in it? And I remember one guy literally told me, like, you know, the like, I think posts get like reported for like, you know, things getting out of hand like once a day on the Facebook group. And you think like a cast iron Facebook group? Yeah. Posts are getting reported that regularly? It's heated. I think people are very proud of their cookware. And I think people are annoyed by the righteous attitudes about the cleaning technique. But just for our listeners, what is what did you land on about the cleaning of cast iron? Are you pro soap or against soap? I think clean it however you however you want to clean it. You know, I don't soap is is not it's it, I, many people told me soap is not going to ruin your cast iron pan. So I would say soap it, don't soap it, do That's, what you want. I kind of I, 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 I don't kind of I do subscribe to that method as well. I've 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 thrown some some dawn onto my cast iron and all has been well in the world. Priya, we ask all of our guests if you had no deadline pressure unlimited resources, and all the time in the world, what book project would you want to work on? Um, so I I don't think I like I don't think a lot of people know this about me, but I sort of have like an academic obsession with like horror as a genre. I think it's really fascinating. I used to like read horror screenplays for fun. So I would really love to write like a horror screenplay as not as an as a novel. It's a weird it's weird because like so I can't watch horror movies because I'm a scaredy cat. So I like haven't I don't watch them, but I'll, but I'll read like as soon as a great horror movie comes out, I'll immediately log on mm. to the Wikipedia summary because there's really, really detailed Wikipedia summaries. And then like if there's like a moment that I'm like, oh, I need a visual on that. I'll like look, look it up on the Internet and like get the visual. But like I cannot watch a horror movie all the way through they're just too scary for me but i am just obsessed with you know with with the pacing of horror movies um and and horror books too which you know most horror movies these days are based off of books uh, you know the the way that you have to really so carefully construct the plot so i think writing a book like a horror book would be so fun because I could just like sort of sit down and like sort of solve it like a puzzle. You sort of start with your twist and, and you go backwards. My One of my good friends, Talene, just wrote a horror screenplay and we would literally go on these runs around Prospect Park and we would unpack like every <laughs> character, every character's motivations and I would ID holes in the plot and then we would fill the holes and I was like, this would, if I had unlimited time, I would totally write a horror That's novel. So, and w- <laughs> would you say that you're on to most twists in the in the books that you're re- reading are you pretty plugged into the pacing or are you often surprised I just started watching a thriller yesterday where I'm like 100% sure I know what the twist is from the from the pilot <laughs> so I feel like I've just I just have studied the genre so deeply that I feel like it's hard to surprise me like I just read the wikipedia summary for that movie Malignant and they were like the twist you'll never see it coming and I was like oh yeah yeah you got it <laughs> let, me, let me ask you if there's a food item at the center of a horror screenplay what would it be if there's a food item at the center of a horror screenplay uh hmm good question um, I love uh, aspects 
maybe an, a cool an, a cool aspect like the knife it's it's in an aspic <laughs> goes back to the blob one of the yeah. OG horror movies <laughs> love that Priya Krishna thank you for joining the Taste Podcast thank you for having me Matt I'm talking today to food journalist and author Adam Arachi. Adam's a bit of an Italian-American food expert. He's written about garlic knots for taste, as well as crab gravy. And he recently wrote an article for taste about a menu item that's always been a bit of an enigma to me, the Godfather sandwich. Adam, if I went to my local Brooklyn sandwich shop and ordered a Godfather sandwich, what can I expect? So, Adam, the Godfather sandwich was a little bit of an enigma to me as well. It's actually not something that I had heard of before I got this assignment from Taste. Uh, But in my research, what I learned is that the Godfather sandwich, there are no absolutes. So it's essentially an upgraded Italian hoagie. But what that upgrade entails is up to the individual deli owner uh, and sandwich artist, if you will. So typically some things you see in there are capicolo, soppressata, prevolone, you know, and all of the kind of really nice Italian lunch meats um, like prosciutto to Parma or prosciutto sandiniele. Some people use a less expensive cooked prosciutto cotto, but it's basically just each individual deli's attempt to present something that's like super deluxe, super swagged out, uh, and everybody kind of kind of puts their own spin on it. It's interesting because you never see a godfather with like meatballs or like even like fried eggplant. It's always kind of like adheres to the cured meats cheese model. But it's always like a little bit fancier, it seems like, or bigger. Yeah, that's accurate. It's definitely not a cutlet sandwich. It's definitely not a veggie hoagie type sandwich. Uh, It's absolutely uh, cold cuts uh, and cheese with all the usual kind of accoutrements for a hoagie. You know, your oil, your vinegar, salt, pepper, oregano. And then people put their own twists on it. Like one of the delis we spoke with in Delaware County, which is just south of Philadelphia, out by the airport, they're big kind of token item on their Godfather sandwich is their house roasted hot and sweet peppers. So you probably wouldn't see something like grilled eggplant or grilled zucchini, but grilled pepper, roasted peppers, at least for for that deli, which is called Rolin, uh, and they've been around for a long time. Their accent is uh, the house roasted peppers. That sounds awesome. When did this sort of like become a thing? Does it predate the movie series or did it start to pop up like around when the first Godfather movie came out? Yeah, the lineage is super certain that it started with the Godfather movie, which was, I believe, 1971 or 72. So the Godfather sandwich may have existed like in theory, but it wasn't named that until after the movie premiered. So, you know, a lot of these deli owners uh, are Italian-Americans or Italian immigrants. You know, the, the Godfather with this iconic cultural moment uh, and people wanted to kind of attach themselves to that. And that's why the Godfather was adopted as a name for these kind of deluxe, big Italian hoagies. It's also really funny to me. I I rewatched all of the Godfather movies during the pandemic. I don't know when the last time you watched them was, but I don't think of them as food movies at all. And like definitely not sandwich movies. No, that's that's what's so crazy about this is that of all like if we're going to like look at all the mob movies, right? Everything else has way more food incorporated into it. Like you think about Goodfellas, a Bronx tale, like food is way more kind of in the face of of these movies than it is The Godfather. Uh, and, you know, we mentioned in the story, the, the way I let it off was when you think about The Godfather, well, what's the first food that you think of? It's probably like the, the basket of oranges rolling down the street. Uh, <laughs> it, it's definitely not a movie that you typically uh, associate with food or, or a piece of kind of mafia movie or television that is so tied to that. Like you think of The Sopranos uh, or something like that. Food is just in every single episode of that show in a very significant way. Uh, But I guess the Godfather being the first big culturally important mob movie, I'm not a film historian, but that's kind of what, what I and and many people would think of 
when that came out, I think just the cultural resonance of that is what people latched on to. Not that they wanted to latch on something about Super Sod or, you know, Pursuit. Right. Totally. Yeah. There started to be sort of this glamorization and romanticization of like Italian mafia culture. Is the sandwich a regional thing at all? I know like I've seen it on tons of New York menus and your article touches a little bit on like the New Jersey sandwich scene. But is it like sort of tied to any particular parts of the States? Yeah, I mean, I think you you see these Godfather sandwiches more likely in areas where you have historic centers of Italian American immigration. So the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, you know, you can find them in Philly, in Jersey, in New York, in Boston, in um, Maryland, Rhode Island, just kind of up and down the Eastern seaboard where, you know, kind of Italians uh, immigrated to and then started their own businesses, you know, sev- you know, many of which were, were delis and sandwich shops. This is where kind of these sandwiches tend to cluster around. Although in, in reporting out the story, you know, we see, we've seen them, you know, really from coast to coast, you know, we had ones in that we found in Wisconsin and in Oregon and in California, but generally where you're going to see them clustered is kind of in that Acela corridor uh, on the East coast. Since the Godfather sandwich is sort of this like amorphous idea, like it can be so many different things. It can contain so many different ingredients I want to talk a little bit about like what your ideal Godfather sandwich is, like your dream deluxe version of an Italian hoagie. Yeah, well, it's such an interesting question because I actually do not eat Italian hoagies in the traditional sense or many hoagies for, for that regard, which is like <laughs> like blasphemous for where I come from. But, you know, I was a super picky eater when I was a kid. And, and you know, now as a professional food writer, I eat tons of stuff, but some kind of childhood aversions really stuck. And for me, uh, one of them is, is wet bread. So I really like not a big wet bread person and also kind of a, a lot of processed and industrial lunch meat. I just, I, I can't get down with that. So the, the Italian hoagie as, as most people would think of it as kind of a, a, a juggernaut of food fears for me. So my ideal Godfather sandwich involves you know, a bread that's really crusty. Uh, I make my own garlic bread uh, a lot, and that's uh, what we have in the recipe on taste. So it's a homemade garlic bread that's going to stay crunchy and not sog out. Uh, We've got a little bit of pesto in there for some brightness and herbaceousness. I really love speck, which is um, a smoked uh, ham from from northern Italy. So I love to bring speck into any kind of Italian sandwich. A little bit of fresh mozzarella is like a nice mild milky cushion against the salt. I love roasted peppers in my ideal godfather. Um, a little bit of fresh prosciutto is, is really lovely as well. So I'm always looking for kind of that interplay of of sweet and hot and salt and sour. Uh, really want that punch of acid uh, at the end with a little bit of vinegar uh, to kind of set everything off. And, and one thing that I love to do is finish my sandwiches with um, just uh, some shaved Parmesan cheese. And that's something that I picked up from Angelo's uh, in South Philly, which is a great pizzeria and sandwich shop. I love their sandwiches and they finish the majority of them with just like a big fistful of uh, of shaved Parmesan. And it's, it's really nice. That's so cool. You rarely see the shaved Parm on a sandwich. I respect yeah, that move. Never. Have you have you had the Italian hoagie at Wawa <laughs> by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like I like Wawa, it, but I don't eat, I would not get an Italian hoagie there. Um, even if I had to get an Italian hoagie, that's probably would not be the one that I choose. I like uh, I like Wawa's breakfast sandwiches and I like their soft pretzels. I, I recommend their Italian hoagie. It's they toast the bread. They have sort of like a variety of condiments to choose from. They do. They offer grated parm, but you can kind of like mix and match. Uh-huh. How you want to do well, it. Well, I respect that. It's surprising. I usually good. get it while while the I just get like a they're like paninis with like turkey, like smoked turkey and honey mustard and bacon, you know, not <laughs> very different from from a Godfather sandwich, but very tasty. Totally. One more thing. If you like a drier Italian sandwich, if you're ever in L.A., you should go to this tiny grocery store called Roma Market where they make one sandwich. They just call it the sandwich. And I can't remember the specifics of what meats are on it, but I think it's like three different meats, 
a cheese just on a really good crusty loaf of bread. It's awesome. That sounds great because I also like super simple sandwiches that, that don't incorporate too much stuff into them and then it gets all lost. After I just told you my ideal godfather has like 17 things in it, but I also like appreciate it um, <laughs> at Tosca Cafe in, in San Francisco, which is a super old place, but has been now redone a couple times. The last time I was there, they do this bar sandwich and it was just like hot supersada, mozzarella on like thin slice of baguette, panini press, and it was like just perfect. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much for being on the Taste Podcast, Adam. I am psyched Also, to be wait, you have a new book coming out soon, right? What's the book? I do have a new book coming out. It uh, drops in November. It's called The Cocktail Workshop. It is 20 Essential Cocktails and How to Make Them Your Own. So I wrote this book with uh, Stephen Gross of Art in the Age, which is a uh, liquor company in Philly. And the approach of this book is basically – how to master 20 classic cocktails, Manhattan, Negroni, Pina Colada, and then how to build off of those classic recipes through swaps and modifiers and homemade ingredients and kind of work your way up a ladder to more complicated cocktails. So it's, it's a great book if you know absolutely nothing about how to make cocktails at home. And it's a great book if you have a little bit um, a little bit more knowledge and skill and are looking to develop, you know, into into more techniques like fat washing or barrel aging or making your own bitters. So that comes out uh, early November and it's a it's going to be a really great book. I can't wait to check it out. Thank you so much for being on the Taste Podcast. Thanks, Anna. Thank you for having me. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.